Hello and welcome everyone. So once again, sorry I got this picture of my puppy here. Maybe at some point I'll come up with a less lazy way to be able to create thumbnails on my desktop that are easy for me to identify the difference between the ethics and economic behavior playlist and everything else, but whatever. So I don't know, maybe you like seeing pictures of my puppy. Anyway, so in this video I'm talking about uh, syntaxes and I'm thinking about applications of optimal paternalism introduced by Thaler and Sunstein and particularly building towards the idea of using either like a nudge um, from the standpoint of behavioral economics some kind of really sort of small uh, change to the environment that the decision maker will react in or react uh, react to um, following whatever path of behavior is deemed to be beneficial from the standpoint of society or whoever is going to be the choice architect. So think about that and we'll think about the implications there. And then actually for the second lecture, I'll see, I'll see examples of that same idea to thinking about environmental policy. And then the other idea is thinking about optimal syntaxes. These are not nudges. Nudges aren't, aren't taxes, but this is another way to kind of guide and steer behavior. And we'll think about this in the context of these fast food and soda taxes that had been getting a lot of press eh, probably over like the last maybe half decade or so, maybe a little bit longer. Anyway, so that's going to be the goal for here. Um, the motivation, if you click through this link, this most of the links here work. There's one that actually doesn't work anymore, and I, I didn't... I don't, I don't know, I didn't bother to swap it out. I'll show you which one that is, but this one does work. You could click through, it'll come to Iowa uh, Public uh, PBS and it'll be an example of a proposed soda tax in Iowa. So that's sort of the motivation, the thinking of using different types of policy interventions to guide behavior. And so firstly, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna think about decision-making at the individual level and think about how people uh, have like behavioral proclivities that go against whatever might be in their long run interest. And we'll consider this in a variety of different ways. And then, like I said, the key things from this lecture is thinking about nudge and then thinking about uh, optimal, thinking about syntaxes, in particular uh, syntaxes with the idea, with the goal of countering time and consistent behavior. So, all right. So the first place I'm going to, I'm going to start off is just this observation that, hey, look, we're faced with a lot of decisions that affect our future self, right? Think You can think about yourself as living in the present, but then always kind of perpetuating into the future. And there is some, the primary beneficiary or the whoever is going to be affected detrimentally due to your behaviors today is your future self, right? The decisions that we are embarking on, it affects the, the future version of ourself, whether we are giving our f future self a higher human capital endowment, hopefully by virtue of going to school or gaining work experience or whatever is the case, learning a skill, um, getting really good at something, lots of practice, or we're giving ourselves worse, worse, uh, worse health um, in the case or a worse, worse uh, circumstances in the case of not taking care of ourselves or not doing doing things that are beneficial today or, or seem good today but are that have long run consequences there's some some examples would be like you know credit card offers and purchases uh, exercising habits dietary choices alcohol drug intake education schooling effort these are all things that affect your present self of course but then have a really large effect um, it's kind of cumulative over time on your future self so what's the issue? Well, standard economic theories suggest that consumers have rational expectations about their future consumption patterns and should choose the utility maximizing options. Is that really what we do? I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I don't believe that all of my past choices were optimal relative to my present self. And I don't believe that my present choices are optimal relative to my future self. So then the question is, well, how can we get better at, how can we get better at decisions? When we're, when we're realizing that we are living and experiencing the present, but ultimately living and experiencing the future, which is always becoming the present. Okay, so what's the issue? Well, even if people were accurately to predict their future preferences, we have commitment and we have self-control problems. There's a couple different issues there. Firstly, you don't know what your future self may or may not like. You have an idea of what your future self might like. But what if it was the case that when I first decided to get a PhD in economics, I assumed, oh, my future self would really like uh, teaching and thinking about 
economics and economic theory and applications of behavioral economics. Turns out I do. But what if I was wrong? Or what if my preferences changed or something like that? Right? You make these decisions really early on and then you're you're kind of um, you have really high switching costs later on. And so like firstly, it's difficult to predict your future self. Secondly, even if you realize, oh yeah, I would really like to be a physician 10 years from now, you might have trouble actually making that come to pass just by virtue of the fact that, well, yeah, I would like to be a physician or I'd like to be an attorney or I'd like to, you know, create this uh, whatever app or, or program or business. But, I, you know, turns out it's actually painful to get to there. <laughs> I don't want to go through all this hard work, right? That's the problem that people can run into is even if you realize and you're in your, in your anticipating correctly what your future self would like, your present self is bearing all those costs, right? And that can be difficult. Here's an example of sort of a famous paper appeared in the AER, American Economic Review, which is a really good journal for you to take a look at. The AER is written with the goal of being accessible to people who have gone through like the first year of the PhD program at kind of like a like a pretty standard PhD program in econ. But it turns out like if you studied econ and if you've gone through intermediate micro, actually a lot of these papers in the American Economic Review, not only is this a top journal, but it's also, they're also relatively accessible. Also, if you're interested in economic uh, literature and economic research, the other really good sort of accessible journals at the undergrad and like even master's level would be Economic Inquiry, uh, would be Journal of Economic Literature and Journal of Economic Perspectives are a collection of kind of really good ones where there's a lot more, a lot of the theory and a lot of the applications are coming conceptually rather than like the, the really kind of uh, rigorous PhD level math. And so, all right, anyway, so the title says it all, paying not to go to the gym, right? Um, so what they did is they constructed a data set with information on membership types and day-to-day -day attendance for almost 8,000 health clubs in New England over three years from the time period of like April Fool's Day, 97 through July 2000. Uh, and then for one club through February uh, 201 or 2001 for the other, oh, sorry, sorry. April, April Fool's through July 2000 for the first and then through February 2001 for the, for the second. I got super distracted because this was like July 2000. That was my first, I started college in June 2000, right out of high school. I didn't want to wait. And so I took, I enrolled in a college class like the next week after graduation and moved in and everything. And it was a lot of fun. So that's what I was doing in, in July 2000. And then February 2001, uh, that was my after, so that would have been like early of my first year of school. And so I was ramping up for the cross country season that I was able to participate in during fall 2001. So um, anyway, um, so what they're able to do in this paper is they're able to track membership type, stand, uh, whether it was standard, student, family, corporate, and the price paid. And they found that consumers are choosing a bad contract relative to what they actually did. So interestingly, consumers with worse attendance delayed canceling the contract despite relatively small transaction costs. And the question is like, how, you know, is this surprising? All right, so well, probably not. So we'd expect that those who would be in the worst contract probably would also, uh, or with, with worst attendance, would probably also be the would, would also be those who'd those who'd have trouble attending the gym would also have trouble canceling the gym membership, which is interesting. Um, this reminds me of a, so I'd seen a I'd seen a stand-up comedy performance by uh, Ryan Hamilton who's got a bit about canceling his uh, gym membership. It's hilarious. So um, it's one of my favorite uh, stand-up comedians. Anyway, so. Um, consumers who chose a monthly membership of over $70 per month pay an average 70% more than under a pay-as-you-go contract for the same number of visits, right? These are people who are paying for a monthly membership, but based on the number of times they actually go, they'd be way better off just paying pay-as-you-go, right? So they're, they're paying for more than they're actually using, essentially. Also, consumers who are on the monthly contract were 17% more likely to stay enrolled past one year than those on annual contracts. But wait a second, the point of the monthly contract is to be able to, right, to be able to cancel right after whichever at any month without waiting for the entire year, right? You're paying higher fees accounting for the fact that you can cancel at any time. Nevertheless, people are more likely to stay enrolled past a year than those on annual contracts. Now, there's actually something interesting. You don't need, you don't need actually like, uh, procrastination and self-control problems to talk about why people wouldn't cancel this. One story just using standard economic theory would be, uh, hey, look, if you've got an annual contract and it makes sort of 
a natural time to cancel that membership would be like at the end of the year, right? And maybe they'd have some prorate or they give you like some type of refund. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know what the structure was for these particular things. But that'd be a story for why the people on annual contracts would just cancel at a year. People on monthly contracts, well, because it's month to month, you know, you'd have, think about the application of the marginal principle. You keep doing something as long as the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost. So do I want to, do I want to stay enrolled for one more month or do I want to incur the cost of having to be disenrolled, right? Well, you know, people are busy and, and maybe you think, well, the benefit of having this membership for an additional month exceeds the cost maybe for that particular month of going into cancel. So maybe that's a story that people would tell themselves. And so that would be the reason why people, if people are trying to think incrementally, they'd make this, they'd make this sort of marginal reasoning uh, fallacy sort of error by virtue of like every month saying that, well, the marginal benefit exceeds the marginal cost of staying enrolled and so they never get disenrolled. So that could be that could be part of the problem. Um, all right, so this is actually featured on I think this is I think this was planet I think this was on planet money. Maybe maybe it's something else. Um, I forget exactly. But it, there's an interesting episode from NPR. You should probably listen to it. So the so this was featured here why we sign up for the gym memberships but never actually go to the gym. So in particular is the observation from this article or from uh, from this piece talking about how well gyms realize this like they, they know that people have trouble canceling and going to the gym and so they this is actually part of their business model so for instance this doesn't seem quite right to me but this is what was cited there which is that planet fitness averages 6,500 members per gym most of which would actually only hold about 300 people right so a lot of people are a lot more people are signed up i mean think so maybe this 6,500 i don't know maybe that maybe that I don't know, maybe that's correct, who knows. But the point is, there's a lot more people that are signed up for it than actually go, right? The business model is to bet that most members never go. I'll give you another example I know for sure is correct. And so here, when I was at the University of Arizona, there's a health and recreation fee that subsidizes the campus recreation center. $425 per year, paid by all U of A students. The fee is $300 for those who enrolled prior to fall of 2017, right? And then let's see, those who are studying abroad enrolled at UA South, which is in Salrita, uh, or other special circumstances are not assessed a health and recreation fee. I think there's like a way that you can opt out if you say that you never go there, never take part in any of the recreation programs. Most people actually don't opt out. University of Arizona has something like 45,000 students, and most of which are going to be paying this $425 per year, or at least when I was there paying somewhere around well, three three hundred dollars seems high. I think when I remember it, what I remember it being is like fifty dollars a semester. But they re they they redid the recreation center and they made it actually kind of cool. But the point is, like everybody's paying in, almost nobody would go. And so I would go all the time. I went almost every day, and it was awesome because you had this beautiful state of the art recreation facility to um, you know lift weights or bike or there's you know pool or whatever it is that you want to do and it wasn't very crowded it was really not very crowded at all there's never a line for equipment it was like it was a great deal for those who actually go well it's a terrible deal for the students who are paying and then never went and you know so interesting okay so what's going on well the gyms are working to attract those who won't show up so unlike university of arizona that'll just you know tack on student fees uh for businesses, people, you know, for the gyms, people need to actually like voluntarily sign up for Planet Fitness or whatever. So what does Planet Fitness do? Well, they hide the intimidating equipment in the back, make the lobby look like a resort to make the casual gym goer more likely to buy a membership. It doesn't look as intimidating. Um, interestingly, why would people, so why would people buy this contract? Well, they might view it as a commitment device, right? People like the idea of being locked into the contract. If this is the following reasoning, which is like, okay, if I buy, buy an annual membership, now I feel like I have to go. I paid for it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to use it. So when I'm signing up for a gym membership, maybe I sign up for the full year because then I know I have to go. And, I'll, and I tell myself I'm going to use it, even though this is sort of willingly opting into a sunk cost fallacy reasoning, right? What's the problem? People ignore this commitment device. And so in some sense, people are, are having this problem where you think, well, I, I don't want to sign up month to month or I don't want to sign up for pay as you go because then, you know, I might never go. But it turns out that's actually right. You probably wouldn't ever go. Most people don't. And so the question is like, or so the, in terms of like signing up for gym membership or, or, or adopting some type of big change to your life like that, 
I mean, the best thing to do is probably try it out on a trial basis. And if it turns out you like it, then then good, right? Like if you decide that you're going to take up snowboarding or skiing, cross country skiing, downhill skiing or boating or kayaking or whatever, like you don't buy the state of the art, top of the line equipment, you buy something used and then, you know, that you can get introduced to whatever is the sport or whatever is the activity. Um, and then if you like it, then you do more and you maybe upgrade your equipment. When do people actually go to Planet Fitness? Well, for the monthly bagel breakfasts and the pizza dinners, or for the mixers, movie nights, and spa treatments, all funded by mutual non-attendance, which is awesome, right? This is sort of the social club, which actually is this sort of self-selecting sample where you all have got the same sort of idea in, con in common, which is the mutual belief, the mutual, uh, the, the mutual belief that we enjoy working out when actually you don't. And so uh, sort of mutual shared uh, love for not actually, not actually for signing up and not actually going. Anyway, so what's the lesson here? Well, those who rarely attend, but then fail to cancel, cancel their memberships, subsidize those who don't go, just like my story from the University of Arizona. This makes gym membership more affordable to everyone and a great deal for those who actually use it. Which, I mean, so what's the, what's the punchline? Well, like if you've got a gym membership or if you're, you know, paying into the system on campus, like you should try to go and find something, that, find something that you like or find a way to opt out of the fee, I guess, right? So anyway, uh, all right. So the next idea I wanna talk about is libertarian paternalism. And the first thing, like they say this in the paper, but I wanna say this here, like don't, so, so people might have some really negative connotations associated with like both of these words. So like, try to like, bear with me on this. It's, it's interesting. And that's, you know, that's why it's included in the course. And so, uh, right. So you could click through here and then this will be, I think that's the clip that has Richard Thaler who recently won the Nobel prize, um, and discussing an application of nudge in Chicago. And then some, actually the example that I'll talk here. But anyway, so it's sort of an interesting idea to, to interesting introduction to Thaler. Um, Richard Thaler has got so a couple of books. So one is uh, Nudge, written, I believe, with Cass Sunstein, if I'm not forgetting, if I'm not forgetting. And the first half is awesome. The second half is a lot of like behavioral finance type stuff, which is where a lot of Thaler's research is, which is good for those who are interested in it. And if you're interested in going into like, you know, something with financial services or banking, you might find that part of the book really interesting. Part of it has to do with healthcare, I think. I don't know. Whatever it was, the second half of the book, I did not. I made it through half the book and then became a circumstance where the marginal benefit of continuing was much lower than the marginal cost. <laughs> so my opportunity cost of my time was too high. I never, I didn't make it through nudge. However, uh, Thaler has a second book, Misbehaving, which is actually a pretty good complement to this class, right? Complimentary good. And so you should if you're interested in reading some of Thaler's work, um, some of the books, I would start with misbehaving. It's kind of it kind of gives a good history of behavioral economics, and there's some really interesting ideas. I mean, there's interesting ideas in Nudge as well. I just have such narrow views uh, or narrow interest, and I'm just I'm really bored by finance and uh, macroeconomics and healthcare and those things, and so it just was not for me. But maybe it's for you. I don't know. <laughs> Everybody's got different interests. So, all right. So the idea from the book: um, most economists are libertarians. Consider the term paternalistic to be uh, derogatory. Most would uh, most would think that the phrase libertarian paternalism is an oxymoron, right? Um, we believe that the anti-paternalist paternalistic fervor expressed by many economists is based on a common combination of a false assumption and at least two misconceptions that they'll talk about. The false assumption is that people make choices that are in their best interest. We've already discussed that. We see people make a lot of choices that are not in their best interest. The first misconception is that there's viable alternatives to paternalism. That's interesting. So we'll see that in a second. And then the second misconception is that paternalism always involves coercion. And it, that need not be the case also. And what they're arguing is if you can get a situation where there's no viable alternatives to paternalism, but you can do it in a non-coercive way, then it might be justified, if not even warranted. All right, so there's many situations where a choice must be made that will affect the choices of others. Suppose the director of a company cafeteria realizes that the order of food arrangements affects choices. And there's three options. One, choose the order that makes consumers best off. Two, choose the order randomly. Or three, choose the order to make consumers um, as worse off as possible, right? The first one's paternalistic for sure, but we probably wouldn't want to just choose randomly and we wouldn't want to choose the one that's going to make people the worst off. 
Uh, and so the idea is, well, if you're going to arrange the order in the cafeteria, let's try to put things where it's going to be helping people, encouraging them to make better choices. So to like un unobtrusively sort of like getting people to to make the choice that's in their best interest. So, for instance, would anyone object to putting fruits and vegetables before the desserts in an elementary school? And then the question is, is this situation fundamentally different if the consumers are adults, right? If no coercion is involved, maybe some types of paternalism are okay. This is libertarian paternalism. Richard Thaler has a maxim which says, like, if you want to get people to do something, make it easy. And so if we want people to eat more fruits and vegetables, make it easy for them and put the fruits and vegetables out in front where you have to, okay, you don't have to get fruits and vegetables. Maybe you want to walk past as I always did in college. I'd walk, so when I'd walk into the cafeteria, I would skip the fruits and vegetables. I'd go to the grilled cheese line, the pizza line, the cookie table, and then I'd get four glasses of milk. And that's what I, that's what I would do. Um, and so, right, I had the choice and I had to walk past the, the healthy fruits and vegetables area, but um, but I always kind of skipped out on it. So that's, you probably don't want to do that, but at least the arrangement in that cafeteria was reasonable relative to what we wanted people to be doing. Um, even if people, so that's the idea is like, this is, you're not, it's not some, I wasn't forced to get fruits and vegetables. I was able to bypass them. It was a little bit more difficult. I had to go out of my way to get the things I actually wanted, but I did, all right. Um, all right, so the second thing is realizing people fail to make rational choices, right? People display dynamic inconsistency in the context of intertemporal choice, right? They value present consumption much more than the future. Oh, that was for sure the case for me. I was way more interested in being able to eat all the cookies and all the cake that was ever before me because we didn't have a whole lot of those things around my house growing up. Well, we did, but not, not like the mountains of sweets that were available in the cafeteria. So of course that's where I went. I mean, why wouldn't I? So anyway, um, so people value present consumption much more than the future. People have self-control problems. And so here's some references. I'll talk about the O'Donohue and uh, Ribbon paper. Uh, actually, I, I don't think I talk about this one. I don't know if there's, so there's, a, there's an interesting paper that I mentioned. It's not the one, it's not the optimal syntaxes. It's called Doing It Now or Later. And it has to do with procrastination on a work project or going to see a movie. It's actually a really interesting paper. And I might bring that into the course. I, I usually talk about it in the classroom. I, ha, I, don't have, I don't have separate slides built around it, but that's an interesting paper. Doing It Now or Later, uh, Donahue and Rabin. It's a really great paper. Anyway, so Surgeon General reports 61% of Americans are overweight or obese in 2003. Right, so I don't know. So maybe think about choice and think about if people are behaving rationally or not. Maybe it's maybe that's evidence, not I don't know. So um, all right, so that's one issue. So thinking about thinking about health decisions. Uh, and the next thing is then thinking about savings decisions. So are people behaving rationally here or not? I don't know. I mean, so there's people don't save enough for retirement. It's it's just like the it's just like the health thing. It's just like it's like the obesity one as well, which is like I I don't know. I mean, so on the one hand, look, you want to make things that are beneficial. You want to you want to come up with beneficial decisions for your future self. On the other hand, we do live in the present, and so you know, like it's good to save for retirement, but it's also good to be able to enjoy your life. And so like. I don't know if it if it means the difference between putting you know an additional five hundred dollars in a given year into retirement versus like using those five hundred dollars to go on a trip that you wouldn't have ordinarily been able to do. You're able to do that when you're relatively young. I don't know. I don't know if I could fault a person for going on the trip rather than putting that into savings, right? Into savings for retirement. Do you want to take that trip when you're sixty, or do you want to take or seventy, or do you want to take that trip when you're thirty or forty, or twenty? I mean, you probably. I mean, think about it, right? So on the one hand, like so. I mean, definitely we're using this as ways to, in, to indicate this sort of general truth, which is like people make bad decisions relative to their own health for the future. We see that. People make bad decisions relative to their own savings for the future. But at the same time as I'm saying this, I, I don't want you, as soon as, as long as I'm like citing and referencing these literature, I don't, I don't want you to, um, to sort of misinterpret what I'm saying here, which is like, let's kind of take this with a grain of salt. Let's recognize the overall truth and the overall principle, which is like people make bad choices that are bad for them for, the, for themselves for the future. Nevertheless, there's a time and a place to think really deliberately about like making sure that you're able to enjoy your time, right? I mean, so that's the point. 
you, does it mean like you t- does, doesn't mean like you go to go, go on an expensive vacation every weekend. It doesn't mean that you do what I did and like eat cake and cookies for every meal. No, but you want to you know, kind of think reasonably and think about, I don't know, Aristotle and the golden mean and thinking about moderation and stuff like this. And anyway, so, all right. So in this example, uh, Thaler, like Thaler, uh, Thaler's got a series of papers thinking about savings and so people making bad decisions relative to savings. So what was going on in this paper, people volunteered to share their portfolio choices by bringing a copy of their most recent statement to the experiment, right? So they came in, they used their actual data. This is like, you know, bring in your retirement portfolio. And then they were shown the probability distributions of the expected retirement income for three investment portfolios labeled A, B, and C. Unbeknownst to them, these were their own and two mimicking the average as well as the median choices of their fellow fellow employees. On average, people rated the mean portfolio equal to their own in terms of the preference, and people rated the median portfolio to be significantly more attractive than their own. Only 20% preferred their own portfolio to the median. It'd be interesting, I didn't see, but I forget. It'd be interesting to match to see if these are people who ought to prefer their portfolio to the median or not, right? But the question they raise is, are people gaining by choosing the investment portfolio for themselves or not, right? And then, and so the idea is, well, maybe let's come up with a way to be able to like have a default enrollment into a savings plan and then people could opt out if they didn't want to. Right. So that's sort of the idea here. Is paternalism inevitable? Well, often planners are forced to set some default option that happens if the agent fails to choose. Right. So think about organ donation in, in all the states I've lived in. So all the states I've lived in, when, it, when you go and you get your driver's license, you have the ability to opt in to be an organ donor. But by default, you're not an organ donor. Right. The status quo, if you're if you don't if you don't make any other decision, if your decision is not to make a decision, you're not enrolled. Um, same thing with voting, right? So voting registration, by default, you're not enrolled as a registered voter. You have the ability to opt in and become a registered voter, but it's something you have to do. The default option is non-action in the case of organ donation and voting, right? All right, so if agents are homo economicus, the default option is irrelevant because people will choose what's best for them. Uh, but people are not. People are not homo economicus. Um, the existing option or status quo tends choice tends to persist. Turns out, actually, whatever is set as the status quo, that seems to be what a lot of people people have a lot of inertia. They won't change. So here's an example of libertarian paternalism. The idea would be: suppose we have a 401k plan and retirement plan with an opt-in versus an automatic enrollment with an opt-out. Right. Well, if you have the opt in, you'll have like under enrollment. If you have automatic enrollment where people can opt out, now you'll have more people right staying in the plan. And so here's the result. Well, initial enrollments jump as much as 49 from 49 percent to 86 percent with the automatic enrollment into a 50 percent employer matching plan. Right. So what ended up happening? Well, there's some people right? 100 minus 86% who decided to opt out, right? They had been automatically enrolled, they opt out. And so you have this, you have a status quo, the status quo is in favor of like, what's good for people in the long run. And then if people decide, hey, this isn't actually, I don't want to be saving this much. Maybe I want to be saving for a down payment for a house or whatever is the case. And that's more important. Okay, fine. Then those individuals are allowed to opt out. So the, so the, Reflection here is implementing the auto enroll with the opt out option is paternalistic. But what if it's the case the employer correctly infers employees prefer to join the 401k and people would themselves per- perceiving themselves to have made a mistake if they didn't join, right? So that's an important observation. Recommendations here from Thaler and Sunstein then the libertarian paternalist should choose the approach that the majority would choose if, ex- if explicit choices were required and revealed that would force people to make their choices explicit and it minimizes the number of opt-outs. Those seem like relatively good criteria, right? Minimizing the number of opt-outs means that you've gotten it right because there's relatively few people that are trying to revise the decision. Okay, so there's something to think about there with with thinking about a choice, uh, choice architect who's setting up things and then coming up with, you know, the system that individuals are then going to uh, be reacting within, and, and then you have the observate, you have the you have the decision to either be you know sort of between auto enrolled and opt out, or auto or not enrolled and then opt in. Turns out, like if it's something that's better for people, it's probably good if there's an opt if you're automatically enrolled and then an opt out. 
yeah, that's going to raise a lot of questions though. How do we decide like in whose, through whose eyes do we decide what's better for people? So anyway, um, all right. So the next thing I want to do is just like reference. If we're talking about Liberty, I want to talk about, uh, you know, John Stuart Mill. And so I'll just read through this really quick and sort of pose some questions. Um, I'm going to, so on the slides, I've got the original text or what I believe was the original text. And then I'm going to read it with, I'm going to read, read it the way that I should. So, all right. The object of this essay is to assert one very simple principle as entitled to govern absolutely the dealings of society with the individuals in the way of compulsion and control, whether the means be, uh, means used be physical force in the form of legal penalties or uh, the moral coercion of public opinion. That principle is that the sole end for which people are warranted individually or collectively in interfering with the liberty or action of any of their number is self-protection. That the only purpose for which power can rightfully be exercised over any member of a civilized community against their will is to prevent harm to others. Their own good, either physical or moral, is not a sufficient warrant. They cannot rightfully be compelled to do or forbear because it would be better for them to do so, because it will make them happier, or because in the opinions of others it would be wise or even right. The only part of conduct of anyone for which they are amenable to society is that which concerns others. In the part which merely concerns themselves, their independence is of right absolute over themselves. Over their own body, mind, the individual is sovereign. Right. So the question, do we agree with Mill? And what would Mill have to say about libertarian paternalism? So, you know, take a moment to reflect. This is usually in class. I'd pose this now as a discussion. Um, we, would, we don't have that we don't have that ability um, unless you want to. I'll put this on. I'll put this on my YouTube, obviously. And if you'd like to for any of these questions, if you'd like to have a conversation in the comments, I'll respond back to you. So um, and then or, you know, on in the course site or whatever. All right. So. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is talk about O'Donohue and Rabbins, thinking about optimal sin taxes. So this is no longer thinking about nudges, taxes, and sin taxes is not nudge. This is now, this is an, like an app, this is, you know, changing the prices. It's sort of, sort of a government policy instrument. Uh, but anyway, so we propose an approach to studying optimal paternalism that allows, that follows naturally from standard assumptions and methods of economic theory, write down assumptions about the distribution of rational and irrational types of agents, about the available policy instruments, and about the government's information about agents, and then investigate which policies are able to achieve the most efficient outcomes. So they are creating this, they're building up this game form. They're thinking that we've got a mechanism design problem, which is, let's set up this, let's set up this feature, realizing some agents are boundedly rational. So we don't have homo economicus we have we have real people and when i think about like what's going to be the optimal si system what i'm going to do here this is a applied theory paper i'm going to show you just a little of the model i'm not going to go through all the details if you care you could download the paper you could read through it you could work through it that's not really the goal of the course the idea of saying hey look we've got this interesting application of economic theory we can model specifically this sort of decision mistake that people can make and we come up with a way using taxes sin taxes to overcome the problem and so the observation is most people have present bias preferences it's a tendency towards immediate gratification in a way that their future self dislikes in the long run here's the utility function we're thinking about here's a clip from here's a clip from seinfeld from uh so if you click through if you find that one it is Jerry Seinfeld talking about his uh, his future self. This is like in the in this time period of within a day. There's uh, there's the during the day person. There's the at night person. And there's the morning person. And there's so I don't want to I won't do the bit, um, but you'll if you click through it's sort of an interesting interesting clip. Uh, right. So here, U T is the instantaneous utility in period T. Delta is just our standard time inconsistent impatience. Beta equals one means standard exponential discounting, right? So beta, this is like for present bias preferences. If that's equal to one, then it's this is standard utility plus future discounting, right? Um, th this is like present period plus a discounted future, right? And so here, so that's what this parameter is doing. If, we, if beta is equal to one, then this is just standard um, discounted future utility. So beta is time and consistent preference for immediate graphication. Beta less than one is extra bias for now over the future. And this is the self-control problem. So if people have extra bias or are present biased, they're valuing the immediate situation more substantially more than the future, then we have this self-control problem. 
All right, so what they do in this paper is they say, all right, let's suppose we have a consumer. We have X, we have Y, we have Z, corresponding to potato chips, carrots, and then some numeraire good, which is just everything else, which is called leisure, I guess. Here's the utility function, and the point is, carrots and the numeraire are standard goods in which they only enter, right? Uh, so we have carrots was Y, it only enters in the immediate period, and we have the numeraire good, uh, leisure only entering in the immediate period, but then we have this interesting present bias. We have this delayed negative effect coming through the consumption of potato chips, right? You consume potatoes entering positively in the immediate period, but then in the future, right, there's this negative coefficient, this uh, delta, uh, or sorry, gamma. All right, so the idea is uh, we, have this, we have this problem where you have this benefit in immediately, but then you have this delayed negative effect with the consumption of this one good. Okay, then what they do in the paper is they solve the constrained maximization problem. Here's the utility function, here's what the problem looks like. You differentiate, you take the partial with respect to x, y, and z, solve a system of equations, right? Here's the budget constraint. If you did this, set up the Lagrangian, it's like an intermediate micro question, you'd get these demands, right? Here's the demands for the goods. The ones you wanna call, uh, let me just call your attention to this one right here, to x star, remember this is the demand for potato chips, right? Rho minus beta gamma, over the price of uh, potato chips. Here's the optimal long run behavior. So this is like where there's, so we don't have that, we don't have uh, the discounting. Uh, we don't have the present bias discounting. And so anyway, if you solve this problem, right, then we get different demands, right? We get um, x, x uh, double star is rho minus gamma over the price of the good. And what this is saying is, hey, look, we would overconsume, right? Whenever beta is less than one, self-control problem causes overconsumption of potato chips, right? And so, oh, sorry, this is maybe the optimal. Yeah, so what is I doing here? Um, anyway, so whatever, whatever, whatever is the case, kind of losing my play, kind of hearing my dog in the background. Um, anyway, so, uh, right, the problem is basically when there's present bias, people we have overconsumption of potato chips. So then the question is, all right, how do we deal with this? So their, op their, their solution is corrective taxes that compensate. So the idea is let's have these new prices, right? Let's put, this, uh, let's put this tax on potato chips. Here's this tax, which could be negative tax, could be a subsidy on carrots, and this changes the demands, right? Then they calculate the optimal taxes, which again, just solving a constrained optimization problem. And it turns out their tax works, right? The model predicts the tax will steer consumers into better choices by explicitly bringing their future costs backward into the present. That's the key. Let's explicitly bring the future costs backward into the present by rather than having this sort of like intangible negative future cost due to potato chips, let's pay that up front through this proxy of the tax. Right? It's just like it's just like other types of corrective taxes with externalities. If there's a negative externality, you're not able to internalize the externality uh, by just telling people about what this cost is. Instead, no, you have this tax, and people don't respond to the negative externality. They respond to the tax that proxies for the externality. That's the idea here. Raising taxes substantially on potato chips may be worth doing so, even if we suspect most people are close to self-controlled. Why? Well, the relatively high tax will help those who don't have self-control. What's the problem? There might be a trade-off between helping those with a self-control problem and those who don't. And that's actually, probably politically, what becomes the problem with, part of what becomes the problem with fast food and soda taxes. All right. Um, it seems policy analysis that incorporates substantive insights and methodological, methodological rigors of economics uh, while being realistic about the nature of errors people make should be enthusiastically and, quick, and quickly embraced, right? The idea is like, hey, let's realize, um, let's, let's realize not only the beautiful application of economic theory, but let's do this in the context of a world where people make mistakes, but we can come up with ways to guide them to make better decisions. All right, so here's the discussion questions. These would be the questions that I would typically pose, though you know we don't have the discussion in real time like we normally would. But so here's the questions. How do you feel about the prospects of optimal syntaxes being applied to consumer goods with a goal of improving public health? What are the relevant moral considerations? If such, if such taxes work on average to make people better off, is it wrong not to implement them? Do policymakers have a moral obligation? That's interesting. Do these taxes violate autonomy? If so, how? Is there an overriding interest in preserving free and autonomous choice? 
And then lastly, is the decision to consume truly free and autonomous? Does advertising work? If so, is it permissible for governments to counteract the effect of junk, uh, of junk food advertisements? Is the stronger duty of governments to protect people or to the firms that employ them? Interesting. So thinking about, you know, thinking about the duty of governments to consumers versus to uh, to protecting a business interest or or markets or whatever commerce generally. All right. So the next thing is thinking about real world applications. So these ideas have escaped, got into the real world. This this is the video that doesn't work. That I guess it says that YouTube account was terminated. So fine. I think this one had to do with with I think it's Denmark's. Is the, the video I have for this one also doesn't work. Whatever. So there's a, a lot of different examples. Soda taxes. There was a fat tax in Denmark that got repealed. Fast food taxes. Lots of different examples. In 2012, there's a proposal supported by New York City Mayor Bloomberg that banned the sale of soft drinks that were greater than 16 ounces. Soda company sued. The ban was ended after an appeal lost at the New York State Supreme Court. Um, and the, the ruling writing, this exceeded the scope of the regulatory authority of the Board of Health, right? And think of like, what's the limits to what we want policymakers to do in the interest of public health? Uh, so in Berkeley, California, the nation's first soda tax passed in, in November of 2014. It was a one cent tax per ounce of sugar sweetened drinks supported by 75% of voters. Similar initiative failed in San Francisco, which is two, well, double, but, um, but still that one, that one failed. Here's the videos, there's a clips for the one in Berkeley and the one for San Francisco. It's interesting. Uh, Denmark, this is the video that the video doesn't work. Um, what happened when Denmark implemented a tax on foods with saturated fat content above 2.3%? Well, Danes began shopping internationally and the tax was ultimately repealed. So then my, so this is interesting. Um, will a tax on all fast food restaurants work? Uh, who's meant to be helped by a tax? Who's, who will be affected? Are they different people? Who's meant to be helped by the tax? Who will be most affected? Are these different? Here's a clip from University of Massachusetts Medical School. Interesting, thinking about uh, their support for fast food tax. So, all right, so the first thing is like, just what I mean in this last section is just seeing, there's a lot of examples. There's one that passed in, in Cook County. Cook County, um, which is home to Chicago, where is that ultimately repealed, they were trying to use the tax to balance the county budget. And that was a problem because, well, it's really easy to get out of Cook County and then to go by across county lines. Uh, there's, a, there's a tax in Philly, in Philadelphia. And there's a lot of interesting examples kind of across the United States and in other parts of the world. Um, and so this is interesting to think about some of the economic and think about some of the ethical, moral ramifications. And there's some really interesting things to explore. The last thing I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna talk about this idea. It's been argued controversially and generally incorrectly by some that fast food is a gift and good. So what's a gift and good? Well, on this view, as the price of fast food rises, so will the quantity demanded. The idea with a gift and good, <clears throat> excuse me, the gift, gift and good is where when the price rises, you buy more, right? So that shouldn't happen. Typically when the price rises, you buy less. What happens with a gift and good is the idea that a gift and good is a strongly inferior good combined with a requirement that a large proportion of income is spent on it. Remember, an inferior good is a good where when you buy it, or you buy more when you become poor. As income rises, you buy you buy less. As income falls, you buy more. Well, so the idea here is you've got a good where the price you're you're spending a lot of your income on it. The price rises. You have to keep buying it. In doing so, you have less money overall, so you now become relatively poorer. As your income falls relative to your consumption bundle, you're gonna seek out inferior goods, which is the one that you've been buying, so you buy more of it. So the idea would be, suppose we have potatoes and we have steak or whatever else, and the price, potatoes are an inferior good, price of p potatoes are a major staple in diet, uh, price of potatoes rises, I have less money to spend on steaks, and I just put all my money into potatoes. That's the argument, that was the argument during the Irish potato famine. There's some papers kind of arguing through economic history that maybe that's not a, a, a true example of a gift and good. But anyway, that's the idea. Um, as the price of the good rises, since such a large proportion of income is devoted to it, this makes the consumer relatively poor in the sense that less remains to go to other goods. Um, the effect is the consumer therefore purchases even more of the inferior good. Um, so I'd say while the Giffen good interpretation of fast food is imprecise, maybe there's similar effects. I don't, I mean, Giffen, fast, fast food is not a Giffen good, but you might be able to see something kind of like this behavior. 
And the reason why is because you think about what people are buying when they're buying fast food, they're buying convenience. There's time bundled up in that price. So it's not just the calories, it's the time saver, it's the convenience. And there's something really interesting there. Um, and then in terms of discussion, it's been argued that soda taxes will hurt low-income Americans the most. See this Iowa PBS clip that I had at the outset? Do you agree? How do you feel about subsidies on healthy food versus taxes on unhealthy? Are they substitutes or complements? Is there a moral difference? Should they be used together or neither or both or whatever is the case? There's some interesting things to explore there. Here's another sort of question. Here's two more questions to kind of reflect on. So we're thinking about this. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and con conclude this video here. I hope you enjoyed the video. See you next time.